Well, I think it's now 7.02, so I think that we can get started. So um, I want to welcome everyone to this evening's presentation of the fungi of our winter woods. Um, this is a uh, continuing webinar series on fungi, which Bill Bacchitis is kind enough to continue bringing us. Um, he is a fun guy. Yeah, he's a fun guy. Exactly. So, uh, of course, this evening's topic is about the winter fungus that we can find. Um, my name is Lauren Bohr. I'm the education coordinator for the public and youth programs here at Mohonk Preserve. I'm going to be monitoring um, and facilitating this presentation. So um, any any issues that come up, any questions, I will be here uh, answering in the chat and uh, doing all the technology things that need to be done. Um, so before I introduce our presenter, Bill, um, I have a, just a few reminders for everyone. You can use the chat to ask questions. There will be time at the end of the presentation for questions, and I'll keep track of all of that. Um, there's also, like as I said, there's going to be time at the end of the presentation, too, for questions. If you notice on the um, side of your screen, you probably have a little hand that says speak. At the end of the pres presentation, we will open up um, for Q&A. So if you would rather type your question in the chat, that is just fine. Um, but if you would like to turn your camera on and ask Bill a question, that is what you will do. It's like you're raising your hands and I will give you access so that um, you will appear on the screen and you can talk directly to Bill and ask a question. So there will be time for that at the end and I'll let you know when that happens. Um, this is being recorded. Um, and it will be um, posted online on our YouTube channel. Um, and I will send a link to everyone who is registered as well. So um, for, for those of you who maybe missed the live broadcast, you might be watching this uh, via that link um, online. So, or, or if you want to revisit this afterwards, um, maybe you had to leave early, you can catch it. And I will email that to everybody at the end of this. So I think that's all of my little housekeeping things that I need to do. So let me introduce you to our presenter. Um, our presenter is Bill Bakaitis, and Bill has taught at Duchess, um, Duchess Community College for 38 years prior to retirement in 2006. You've been retired for a little bit of time here. During his teaching career, he was granted sabbaticals to study graduate level mycology, um, both at SUNY New Paltz and at the New York State Museum in Albany, where he worked with John Haynes, the New York State mycologist. <clears throat> Excuse me, he's a popular speaker. He's very popular here at Mohonk Preserve. Um, who has given educational programs in mycology at the Institute of Ecosystem Study in Millbrook, um, the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, uh, Hudsonia at Bard College, as well as many other institutions throughout the Northeast. In 1983, he founded the Mid-Hudson Mycological Association, uh, and since 1984 has worked with the poison control networks throughout the Northeast. His articles have been published in New York State Conservationist, Adirondack Life, Mid-Hudson Magazine, the Poughkeepsie Journal, uh, Mushroom, the Journal of Wild Mushrooming, um, where he's a uh, continuing editor, and elsewhere, lots of places around. Um, so he has a great background, uh, knows way more about fungus than I do, and it's always a pleasure to hear him speak. Um, so without further ado, here is Bill Bakaitis. He's going to be presenting on Fungi of Our Winter Woods. So take it away, Bill. Yeah, thank you, Lauren. That's a nice introduction there, yeah. Well, here we go. Uh, fungi of our winter wood, uh, woods. Uh, and um, without further ado, let's just start to look and see what we got here. Uh, these are all, I collected all of these one day. Uh, it says January 2021, but it's, it was 2022. I just I forget, used, I typed in the old year. Uh, but it just shows you how many things are out there in winter. And it's one of the reasons to go out, you know, just to go out to sort of get a, uh, a feel for what kind of fungi are around. This is just a small suite of the uh, of about 3,000 fungi which fruit in our area. And one of the nice things about going out in the wintertime is that it's reduced the number of fungi we're going to see. So you can start to, to get a feel for uh, uh, what it means to identify them, how you do that, and and uh, you get to learn uh, the subset before you start plunging into the, the larger set of the 3,000 or so that are around here. But probably the most important reason we go out in 
there if there are 70 people signed up for this talk there are probably 70 different reasons uh for me it's just to go out you know i just like to go out in the woods i'm sure most of you do uh, the the field and forest and i like to have a purpose whether it's watching birds you know or or whatever it just gives me a focus of, of my own walk and my own mind and my own perceptions so <clears throat> those are i think maybe two reasons why we go out in the winter so uh, during this talk, I'm going to talk about some of the fleshy fungi. We're not going to find many of those because uh, it, it, it takes the, it needs to be warmer for, to get fleshy fungi. Uh, but among those, and they do, some of them do appear and they, they persist, there are some edibles and there are some toxic ones. And we'll talk about both of those kinds of things. Uh, and then the majority of the talk, uh, the greatest part, will be about the more persistent fungi, uh, the conks and brackets and the shelves and parchments and crusts and then small stuff and remains of the last season. So I will be talking uh, fast here because I want to get through all of these slides. Uh, we'll have a chance you can ask questions a, a bit later. Uh, and if I if I you, you will have a chance to go back and review them uh, later. So I'll, I'll want to cover all of these. So when we talk about winter. There are lots of different conditions in winter, lots of different times. I mean, what does winter mean? Is it is it from the the D December twenty first until until the spring equinox, or is it uh, December, January, February, or January, February, March, or is it from November to April? Uh, is it all any time the snow on the ground? There are lots of different ways you can define winter. Uh, this kind of winter right here in the upper left hand corner is not as beautiful. It's not very productive for finding fungi, as you can see why. First of all, it's a monoculture pretty much all one kind of tree there, and it's all covered with snow. You know, things get a little better here and here, and here, this would be wonderful if it wasn't snow covered, and maybe that's good there because we, what you want is to find a lot of stuff on the ground. We're gonna be talking about mostly lignicolous fungi, fungi which live on wood, decay wood, and they persist. So these kinds of areas here are the ones that, that you most likely find fungi. But you will find some here and here, uh, just less the uh, less productive. I should say something about mushroom names. <clears throat> the names that we're going to be using here on, in this talk uh, are field guide names. Uh, they're based on macroscopic characteristics. Uh, those of you who uh, were around for one for our previous talks will remember in the Chanerelle talk there was a good deal of uh, discussion about the, the three systems. Uh, in place, uh, the, the old, old field guide system, the biological species concept, and then the DNA cladistic system. Uh, but it, no matter which one you use, the names are in constant flux. They change all the time. Uh, if you go back to the Chanterelle talk, uh, talk number four, you can follow up on this in some detail. So we're going to use macroscopic field guide names. We bring into the woods as our hands and our eyes and our and we feel things and look at things, um, and and uh, that's what we're using. The, the best book uh, consensus, the best book for all around book for Amer uh, mushrooms in, in the Northeast is the Audubon Society Field Guide. It is currently not available, and it's not quite clear why it's not, not available. I'm told that it's been being reprinted in Japan, and whether it's this edition or a revised edition, I don't know. So there are a couple of reasons there. The, the supply line crunch may be part of that. Uh, you can't get that book if you don't have it. This is one which I would recommend. It's a simple guide, Mushrooms to the Northeast. Uh, it's available on $12 or $13, something like that. Again, it's small. It fits into your pocket, easy to carry around. There's my knife. It's three inches long here, closed. You'll see that throughout the talk. It's six inches open, but that's a good size marker. Um, so uh, there's a handout that you all should have called Frosty Fungi of Our Winter Woods. And in that uh, handout, I list every fungus we're going to talk about here and the page the number and the page guides to these two sources here. Uh, if you're interested in going on into more detailed work, uh, there are some uh, resources that are mentioned in that uh, Frosty Fungi of Our Winter Woods. There are a number of books and I, I'll call your attention to the uh, to the most recent book here, I don't know if you can see that very good. It's uh, this is by Alan Bissett, his wife Arlene Bissett, and Diana Smith. Diana, many of you might will know from the coma, uh, 
Mycological Association of Connecticut, Westchester, and the pioneer. And she was also editor of the Medicinal Mushroom, um, um, what do you call it, um, committee at, at North American Mycological Association. So um, it's, it's about a $70 book, but it's, it's very good. And it has, its names are based now on DNA work. So, so those things are going on. Uh, two good websites, the, mushroom, the Michael Quo's Mushroom Expert and Gary Emberger's Wood Decay Fungi. They're both very good websites. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to talk, talk first about fleshy fungi. And those have a particular kind of cell structure, which makes them just appear very quickly. They mushroom up. They balloon up from the earth. And if you remember, those of you who were, uh, remember from uh, the first talk, we talked about the, the typical basidiomycete life cycle, the spore falls to the ground, it germinates, it makes a, 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 a hyphae there that, that together they get, they form a dicaryotic mycelium, it goes back to form a fruiting body and release spores and the whole cycle takes place. All of this is, is a function of just this one kind of cell, the, the uh, generative uh, cell which, uh, which is present there. So it balloons quickly and it decays quickly and that's why they're fleshy fungi. Later, when we talk about polypores, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll look uh, at the dimetic and trimetic structures there. So we'll talk here about a number of edibles and some toxic mushrooms, and we'll go those in order. Uh, I printed this out maybe November. It was a three-month uh, forecast for winter in the Northeast, and we are above normal or normal. And normal, temp normal growth of these fleshy fungi, particularly... Uh, the oyster mushrooms and, and flamulina. Uh, temperatures about 40 degrees for a period of time, you can get those fruiting. So we may we may see some of those coming up. This is the first of us uh, fleshy edible mushrooms. It's called the winter mushroom. The Latin name is flamulina volutipes. Uh, sometimes it's called the velvet footed calibia or velvet shank, uh, depending upon the text you use. Uh, it grows a lot on elm trees. Now, I, this is one from, from the summertime, spring or summertime, and I show it just to show you the essential characteristics. It's gilled. It has white gills and white spores, and the gills touch the stem. The stem itself, it grows in these clusters. The stem itself turns this kind of velvet, burnt velvet color, hence the velvet-footed calibia. It one time was a calibia. Uh, now it's flamulina. When you look at these in the winter time, you'll tend to find them under the bark of trees, particularly elm trees, elm trees which are infected with the Dutch elm disease. And as that fungus uh, strangulates the, the tree, the, 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 the cambium layer gets absolutely clogged with sugars. And that's the perfect medium for flamulina to grow. And it grows so much it just sprouts and pushes the bark off. So that's one thing you'll look for, the bark flaking off. Uh, so this is what they tend to look like. They're not nearly as colorful as the, the ones in the summertime, but they can get up to a pound clusters here. Uh, this is what they look like coming out of the bark in the wintertime. Uh, this is a bad color uh, separation here. I think it was the green of the, the mossy bark, which, uh, which set that off in that way. But, but, but they are sort of butterscotch capped on that. They are in these clusters. Uh, if you look at this kind of structure here, you can see how it is that when you go to the store and you buy enoki or enokitake, uh, what you're looking at is the same species. These are the same species. These, these the, 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 the commercial ones are cultivated on straw. But these mushrooms are present every month of the year in the Mid-Hudson area. Uh, there's a chance we'll find some. They're quite good. They're mucilaginous, but quite good. The prime, uh, the gold medal, <laughs> so to speak, of the fungi here, will be the oyster mushroom. Uh, and it is really choice. You know, it's big, it's meaty, it has a great flavor. It sends its little tentacles into the wood and captures living organisms, nematodes, which it digests and it incorporates all that nitrogenous protein in the flesh here. It's why it smells a little fishy. Uh, also, this mushroom is dimetic. It's not monometic. So it has, in addition to the generative hyphae, it has another... Uh, a kind of hyphae in there, which which uh, makes it kind of rubbery, particularly after it gets fro frozen a few times. It's a bit rubbery. Uh, not to worry, though, it's still edible unless it really is uh, spoiled and you know, rotten. 
So it's found year round um, in throughout the area and they're you know, maybe maybe clusters up to five pounds. They're, uh, I found this one on a on an elm tree and I would, every time I'd going to and from work, I would take one or two of them and bring it home and cook it. It was there for about three weeks or three weeks or so. This is another oyster. It's the green winter oyster. It's not a pleurotus. Um, it is a pinellus and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a different family of mushrooms, but it's called an oyster because it actually looks more like oysters than the others do. Again, it has these gills that go down into the tough stem at the bottom. This mushroom grows on, on punky wood, sometimes on woods growing straight up and down, uh, and it only fruits after a frost. So you, you have to wait until there's a frost before you find this coming out. They are a little tougher and a little bitter than the oyster mushrooms, but nevertheless uh, edible. Uh, the ones that I find in the last few days are all orange and kind of run by rotten. This was found uh, in late January before the heavy snows and was still edible at that time. Uh, also, in late fall and early winter, you're, you're likely to find these brick caps, Nematoloma sublatericium uh, uh, or Hypoloma sublatericium. They're edible. Uh, they're on stumps and roots, and they have a purplish spore print, as you can see here. Uh, there's three common species in the Northeast. This is the one which is most likely to fruit on in the wintertime. So it's uh, called brick caps because of the brick color there. There it is coming out of the ground. I wouldn't particularly eat this one because it would be full of dirt. This one would be okay. And jelly fungi, uh, we may, they're, they're gonna be the quickest to come back in, in a warm spell. And we may very well find some of these. Uh, so the, these are um, Basidium isetes, a particular subdivision. Um, the, the, the Basidium is actually split in two. And so that, that defines the entire uh, genus, the family of them. So this is uh, Exidia glandulosa. And this over here is Tremella mesenterica. Uh, mesen, the mesentery is the uh, lining of the intest of the stomach, I think. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, these, these will reappear after warm winter rains. And I'll show you what they look like in the winter. When they dry up, they, this, they're very hard and scaly, horny, like this. This was, um, you, know, you see, maybe a week or two ago I found this one. And uh, this is what, when it fruits, when it gets warmer, it just it just fills out and it looks like this Exidia recisa. Sometimes this the Exidia's uh, um, tremellas are called witch's butter. So that's that's one there. These these are edible. There's there's not much to them though, but they're considered edible. Here's uh, the first deadly mushroom in the winter. It's Gallerina autumnalis, and this mushroom uh, has exactly the same uh, poisons that Amanita do. So. Uh, you eat them and there's no particular effect for a, for a day and then you get sick, you, they attack the red blood cells and then your liver and kidneys, uh, kidneys first then liver. And uh, if you're going to die, death will come about a week after that. Uh, they grow on punky wood, not on uh, the flamulina was on straight wood. Wood was st still standing and you could you could pound it with a hammer and it would ring. This, this wood here, you pound it with your fist and your fist is likely to go into the wood. It's so punky. So uh, again, this is present, it's called autumnalis, but it's present every month of the year. Here, I put here a, 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 a slide of a, the underside of it. You see it has brown gills, brown spores, and it has a ring around the stem. Flamulina does not have that. And again, you see how punky the, 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 the wood is right there. Uh, if you have a microscope, the spores will have, will be kind of warted, and there will be a, 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 a place called a plague, uh, a P-L-A-G-E, plague, right near the uh, pilar appendage where it attaches to the to the uh, sterigma of the basidium. And uh, that is bald. Otherwise, it's, it's a rusty brown warted spore. Um, so these uh, you would not want to collect uh, or eat. Here's a poison mushroom that not many people know about, and I want to call it to your attention because there are people among us, probably uh, in the audience today, uh, who will go out and find mushrooms like, like turkey tails. Tribbert's whole turkey tails are, 
are good for your health and you'll find it something like this it looks like a turkey tail and you bring it home and make a tea out of it well you don't want to make a tea out of this mushroom uh, because it contains uh, a, a very serious toxins uh, polyporic acid about 20 to 40 percent dry weight so if you were to make a tea out of this and drink it uh, that would be a very serious condition um, um, now, if you look very closely, how you can tell this from, from uh, turkey tails, if you look very closely at your screen, you might be able to see how these pores here are angular and they're arranged almost at a random order. Uh, and that's one way you can tell this fungus. It's soft, it's pliable, it's kind of juicy. Uh, here, if you touch it with uh, KOH, um, like Drano, uh, it will produce a violet reaction. And this is a legitimate use for it because this is this dyeing is a is a dyeing for for fabrics. So this will make it one of the uh, the rather more difficult to find purple violet dyes. So that's Hapalopolis nigilans, or it's as another name as well. Now here's one that looks a bit like it. You would not mistake this for a turkey tail, I don't think. But it does smell very good, and some people might be tempted to eat it. It's considered not edible. I don't know if it would hurt you if you eat it or not. Uh, it's a Tyromyces geonosis, uh, geonosis or al proliferous albellus. Uh, you squeeze it, and moisture comes out of it. It smells pretty good. You know, it smells a bit like cheese. Um, this one is so old, uh, well, it's been frozen and thawed a number of times. And this is the pores, the underside, the hymenium, where the pores are. And you see there's a, an orange mold growing on that. The mold is probably another fungus. So that would be a hypomycete growing on a mycete, <laughs> yes. And then the really beautiful Phyllotopsis nigilans. This is really a gorgeous mushroom when you find them fruiting like this. Uh, they're, they have this really delicate peachy orange color, and they're just lovely. They're not edible. Uh, they're, they're bitter. You wouldn't want to eat them. But they are pretty. Now, once they're out uh, for a while, they're going to get bleached. And here's a log uh, just completely covered with them. Uh, you wouldn't know it by looking at the top, but if you take one of the caps and turn it over, you can see it still has that, that uh, orangey coloration to it. So this is... Uh, uh, really good, good fungus to keep your eyes open for. Now, we look at the more persistent fungi. Uh, these are ones that have two or three types of cells. If it has all mushrooms, it will have the generative cell. If it has either the dimetic, I'm sorry, the, the skeletal cell or the binding cell, we call it dimetic. So it can have either of those and be dimetic, two, two of these. Uh, if it has all three, then it's called trimitic. And uh, this is the, the kinds of fungi uh, that we tend to find in the wintertime. They're woody conks and shells. Uh, you know, you can hit them with a hammer and, and you know, they're, they're tough things or uh, shelving mushrooms. And they, 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 it takes a longer time to form and they last a long time. And that's why we see them in the wintertime. So they're, uh, they're lignicolous, which means they live on wood. They're saprophytic. That's how they get their their food from digesting uh, wood and cellulose products. They produce both brown and white rot. Uh, they can be annual or perennial. They can exist on hardwoods or softwoods. They can uh, cause heart rot or sapwood rot. And so we'll have a look at those things uh, uh, in the next slide or two. But just to call your attention that uh, program two of the series, Ecological Importance of Fungi, covers this, this all this material in detail. So I won't cover it too much here. Here we see two softwoods on the top. These are pine. And you can see the pine, all the, that's the resin that flows from the sapwood of the, of the, of the, the log. So this is where the, 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 the tree lives and grows. The, the wood inside is all dead. So the sapwood will naturally tend to, to prohibit uh, infection from fungi and bacteria. And uh, this, these resins really do a good job of that. Uh, but, you know, one fungi get inside, you can see here where there's a little rot starting here. And this one here is completely rotted out. Kind of neat, neat kind of uh, visual there. Uh, so this would be softwoods and this would be a hardwood, maybe an oak. And you see the same thing. The heartwood is dead wood. 
So fungi get in there, there's no defenses, and they can eat, eat all the dead wood out, and the living sapwood continues to fight the fungus. Uh, but there are some fungi which will uh, uh, attack the, the sapwood as well. So uh, the two kinds of rot, white rot, will de degrade cellulose and lignin. This degrees everything, hemicellulose, cellulose, and lignin. And what you're left with is a white kind of mass. It's very soft, uh, very pulpy, and disappears very quickly. Uh, this is used by lots of uh, lots of ants and invertebrates, and uh, and you'll find it also used uh, by bacteria. It will just dissolve this very quickly. On the other hand, the brown rot are caused by fungi which can digest the the cellulose and hemicellulose, but not the lignin. So the lignin stays behind as this brown mass. Sometimes it's called cube rot here. You can see how this, these cubes here, as uh, it's being burnt through by peroxides hydrogen peroxide and manganese peroxide just burn through the wood there. Um, it's one of the reasons why decay here, they, they don't burn very hot because the, the calories have been burned out. So the lignin is very difficult to digest and it remains in the soil for a long, long period of time. Uh, just to back up a minute, anything that can digest lignin can also digest a lot of our synthetic uh, dangerous chemicals like DDT and PCBs. So the white rot fungi are often used in phytoremediation, mycoremediation. Now, we're moving on looking at conchs and brackets. And you see here, these are the persistent woody kind of structures that grow on a tree. This looks like it's on a birch tree, doesn't it? Uh, so they're the, the fruiting bodies, this is really a fruiting body. They can be annual or perennial. These, these ridges uh, are growth spurts. They not necessarily uh, coordinated with the, with the calendar of the seasons, but they do come about periodically, either annually or, or during the course of the year. Uh, they're dye or trimitic, and they can produce either white or brown rot. This one is Fomius fomentarius, one of the most common that we find in the area. And here it is where I've just cut it in two. When you cut it in two, you can see these annual growth rings here. You can see them inside, the growth rings right here. So it just grows, and every time it grows, uh, it sends out another another um, growth on the top and through the bottom. So kind of hard on the top and soft on the bottom. So this is a white rot fungus, and it produces stem decay, which means that the, the entire structure of the wood suddenly gives way and just breaks apart. Now, Fomis fomentarius uh, is often called amadou, and it's been used as tinder, I think maybe the Iceman carried some of that to, for either medicinal purposes or for, for to carry fire with him. Uh, to dry flies in angling and fly tying, I and mean, you're fishing with a dry fly and it gets wet, you can use an amadou to, to dry it out. You can make felt-like hats or you can make vegan leather. Now here's one for you, vegan leather. And this may be a vegan right here, I don't know. There's a little sole patch and there's a mustache and some earrings and uh, a hoodie, and here is your, your amadou hat, a hat made out of a mushroom. Uh, here's the, the, the fomentarius, and you see it has a skin. Underneath it, it has this felt-like substance called amadou, and then you have the spores. So this is the area here that you would uh, uh, carve out, and I, I believe what you do is you soak it in water, and then you pound it apart and probably force it through a screen, maybe like you make paper. I'm, I'm just guessing, but you can find these these on uh, online, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, here is a, a little patch of it used to dry flies. I made one of these dry flies and it works, <laughs> but yada yada, it works. Now this is a birch tree and here's another kind of fungus on it. This is the birch conch, uh, Piptopora spectulinus or Fomatopsis betulina, and uh, this has uh, grows almost exclusively on birch, and it has uh, its pores underneath, this is the top, this is the bottom, and it's white uh, pores, and it has this little rim around it, okay? I am told that when these are young, you can fresh, you can get it and slice them up and cook them in, in hot fat, and they're called Saratoga chips. There you go. This right here is near the Ashokan Reservoir, and you can see some of the reservoir there. 
uh, the Ashoka, as you know, floods and, and dries up. And so this lot of moisture keeps pushing back and forth there. A good area to find a lot of fungi around the reservoir. Uh, most of you know this mushroom. This is the artist conch. It's Ganoderma aplanatum. Aplanatum means it's flat, and Ganoderma means it's bald on the top. So this flat, bald mushroom here, shiny top to it. Uh, and it has these annual layers. Here's this, 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 this surface, and here's one layer, and here's another layer, here's the third layer. And the layers, of, uh, as they're growing, there's a skin which is on the top of it. And if you knock the mushroom off the tree, and it's dead, then you can scratch through this layer here to the darker tubes underneath, and you can, you can etch your little uh, artistic rendering, right? just like that. If you leave the mushroom on the tree and you etch it, then this gets covered over with that skin, and it gets buried inside the mushroom. I don't know if you can later recover it. We see some cryptic notes there about where the treasure is buried. Uh, I don't know how you do that, but uh, but it, it's going to cover that over. Uh, they uh, they this is a white rot fungus, but it produces billions of brown spores every day. And when you come by these mushrooms when they are when they're sporulating, the whole area is just covered with this brown. I mean, it'll be covered for for a yard or two out, just covered with this brown dust all over the place. And the dust is so light that when it falls out of the pores underneath, it just, Brownian movement, just, just carries it all, all out through the forest. So it's a very prolific uh, and, uh, and, and, and uh, destructive uh, fungus. Now we come to the varnish conchs. These are the Ganoderma species. Uh, typically, we think of Ganoderma tsuge, hemlock, uh, suge, Ganoderma suge, or Ganoderma lucidum, growing on hardwoods. Uh, but there are about a dozen species, uh, species of Ganoderma. Uh, all of them are treated um, in the popular literature pretty much the same. They're called Rishi or Lingchi, and uh, you can uh, make a lot of money by bringing them to your local health food store, and you can uh, sell them there. A lot of people will buy it. Uh, potent medicinal mushroom said to boost immunity and aid in healing cancer. That's what it said. Uh, before you start to collect this or eat it on your own, I would urge you to do some serious reading. Uh, if you go to uh, the North American Mycological Association's website, look for the one by uh, Diana Smith. She uh, was um, the chair of the Medicinal Mushroom Committee, and there's an article she has there. Uh, a substantial portion of that article has been reproduced in that book that she's done with, uh, with the Bissets, Polypores and Similar Fungi of Eastern and North Central America, and it's been added to. And I would say that before you get involved in, in treating yourself with any of these mushrooms, you should really have a look at that because there are serious Contraindications, which uh, she points to in the literature, uh, the journal, the, the serious journals say stay away from these things. Sloan Kettering uh, had tried these as an adjunct, and they they say stay away from them. Uh, this is another medicinal mushroom. This is chaga. Chaga is a Russian word which means uh, uh, cinder or clinker, uh, and I think it's just been translated into canker chaga canker, but there it is. That's where it is growing again on a birch tree. It, it's pretty much limited to birch, uh, the different species of birch. Uh, and what you see on the outside of the birch here is almost pure mycelium, uh, the dyed karyotic mycelium of the, the fungus. Uh, the fruiting body, the actual um, fruiting body is very hard to see and rarely ever seen. I've only seen it in photographs twice. I, mean, I may have seen it in a collection at a, at a, at a foray uh, once in New Hampshire. But it's very inconspicuous, a, uh, a little yellowish thing. Here's where someone has knocked off a couple of pieces here. You see this black kink, canker on it. Uh, and here's where they've completely taken it off. Uh, so it's parasitic. It starts on trees uh, that are 30, 40 years old, and it grows out. And... Uh, you don't find the fruiting body until the tree is dead and fallen on the ground. Again, purported medicinal. 
it's widely harvested in the wild and uh, uh, it, uh, in some places it endangers the, the forest, the birch trees, because so many people collect it. I don't know if I should read this or just let you read it. I'm going to take a sip of water. I should point out that Michael Quo, his mushroom uh, expert uh, website, is uh, a, an authority. Uh, and uh, this is, he doesn't say this uh, lightly, um, but it is uh, consistent with most scientific research. There are some people who, uh, who still think that these are, edible, they, I, these are medicinal mushrooms, but uh, uh, the, the evidence I have seen, I, I've, I've written four articles uh, which have been circulating. I think the last of them on the, um, I think they've all been in the New York Mycological Association's newsletters and some other newsletters around the Northeast and uh, NAMA uh, in its journal, uh, Michelvania will, will be publishing the last, the ones on um, the, is that kind of effect? I forget the name of the effect. <laughs> Where, where where you think it's going to happen and it happens, it'll come to me as I go along. But it just goes to show, call me the absent-minded fun guy. I don't know. Uh, so uh, again here, there is no uh, legitimate scientific support for the idea that mushrooms are medicinal. Uh, so we can get compounds from them. And obviously uh, some of the uh, uh, ascomycetes are good at that and the phycomycetes, the molds will, will give us uh, chemicals which we can use, but uh, eating mushrooms uh, is not going to do it. He's also put this, uh, this same notice other places, uh, for example, uh, with Ganoderma suge. And nevertheless, people go out and they do collect uh, uh, chaga and they make tea out of it. And sometimes people collect this and they make a tea out of it and it it will have a flavor. This is a uh, chaga, uh, the, the inner notice uh, 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 chaga mushroom uh, is um, obliquous, does have a nice flavor to it. Uh, it and incidentally, it has some con severe contraindications for some medical conditions. So before you even drink the tea just for pleasure, you should have a look at that. But this will have a flavor too. It's, I think the terpenoids they call these, terpenes uh, and, ses and sesquiterpenes, they're the chemicals that give flavors uh, to foods. Uh, and, and the present in here, this is a cherry. So this is a black knot of cherry and it will taste a little bit like cherry, but this is not chaga. Uh, nevertheless, some people collect it and they think it's chaga and they have a good time with it. This is an ascomycete and has with a 10 power hand lens. You can see these little tiny kinds of uh, parathesia there. Uh, some people collect this mushroom and make a tea out of it. This is gra Globophomys graviolens. Uh, a, a graviolens refers to the sickeningly sweet smell that it has. Uh, this is what it looks like in the winter time. This is what it looks like in the summer. Pretty rare. I've only seen it a half dozen times. But I do know uh, there are some some, uh, some some people who make tinctures and sell them, and they they they've tried this mushroom in their cells. Here's an Inonotus hispidus, as called an oak tank canker. It's another Inonotus, uh, Inonotus, and it uh, the, the whole genus. If you touch them with with uh, five percent uh, potassium hydroxide, Drano, it will turn the flesh will turn very black. Age will do that too. And you see here, here this was the fresh one, has a beautiful rusty brown hair on the top, uh, this beige yellow on the, on the bottom. And when it gets old and dies, it has this uh, black look to it. It could be mistaken for uh, um, chaga. 
called oak canker, a serious disease of oak trees. There's another Inonotus dryadius, and this one gets so big it just encircles the butts of trees. I've seen trees that were three foot in diameter, and this went almost the entire way around. Uh, causes a white rot of the roots in the base of the tree, and the tree will topple over in time. If you look very closely, when you get them up close, you often see little tiny holes, pores, right in the rounded edge at this. And they often uh, have, have amber drops coming from it. And here is the dye maker's mushroom, Phaeolus schweinitzii. And this is what it looks like in the fall. And right here is a mushroom shaped knitted <laughs> mushroom, knitted out of yarn, wool yarn, and it's been dyed in this plant. Okay, and, uh, and you can get many different colors, or I should say several at least, depending upon the mordant you use. The mordants are the metals that are used with, with the juices, the, the teas you make this, you soak the, the, the wool in. And if you use nails for iron or use copper pipe for copper, you'll get different colors. Uh, this is what it looks like in the winter. And I do not know if, the, if in the winter it still contains the dye qualities or not, but that's the, the dye maker's mushroom. Always on, on wood, in the, the, the other two run. On the, the, we're on varied wood. Uh, this this mushroom, I'm sure most of you know, this is the chicken mushroom to be distinguished from the hen of the woods mushroom to be distinguished from another chicken mushroom, but we call them chicken. This is often called chicken mushrooms or sulfur shelf. Uh, the Latin name is Latiparus sulfurius. It used to be Polyparus sulfurius, but uh, one time, uh, polypores had both brown rot and white, white rot fungi in it, and then a determination was made that to call someone polypore, polyporous, it should only be white rot, and this is a brown rot mushroom, so it was taken out, put it into its own genus called Latiparus. We used to think there was only one species of sulfur shelf in North America. Uh, some of them, sometimes people got sick to them, and we thought, well, it's because they were a woman. That's true, that's what they said. Or because they drank alcohol, uh, yada, yada, yada. It turns out that almost all of these will cause an allergic reaction. The ones growing on oak are generally safe. The ones growing on other trees, like, uh, for example, uh, cherry, this grows on cherry, uh, is, is more likely to cause gastric upset, but, but, but it's not terrible. The ones growing on hemlock, almost guaranteed that in over half the population get very serious gastric upset. Uh, and so we have different names for those species. So there, there are seven different species. The one growing on hemlock is, is uh, Latiparus um, huronensis for Huron County in Michigan. This is the summer presentation. Orange on top, yellow on the bottom. After uh, a while, they start to bleach out and get white like this. And they, they cause extensive brown rot. And what you're likely to find in the wintertime Here's the remains. You're walking on the woods and you see this uh, lying here. And this is my hat by size reference. It was a big uh, Latipra sulfurious. And this is what's left of it. Okay. There's a sister species, Latipra cincinnatus, which is pink and white. And when fresh and young, it grows on more likely on the ground. Those are both edible on oak. Now, this is one which is a lookalike to the hen of the woods. The hen of the woods is Graffola frondosa, uh, Polyparus frondosius, uh, and uh, you, well, you won't find any of those growing around in the wintertime. They, they get eaten by people, uh, by uh, woodchucks, by squirrels, by deer, by turkey. Uh, there's not much left of them by the time it gets wintertime. But Mary Pilus giganteus, uh, some stinia, I used to be Polyparus giganteus, uh, is, turns black uh, when it's young and tender. It's edible when it's young and tender, but it, the, the end of it turns black and then it gets hard. And you can wrap this. It's almost like uh, like cardboard at this point. Uh, uh, it's uh, cellulose materials, very hard. So you, you might find some of these around uh, growing uh, here and there in the woods. Oops, we must be at the end of that. Let me see, Lauren, how do I get to the next program? All right. Let's do the next one. Okay, here we go.
Hey, there we go. Okay, very good, right? Now this we're going to hear, uh, look here at, at it's, it, 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 this shape is this conch shape. It's very typical, isn't it? And this one grows uh, on locust trees, uh, almost exclusively on locust trees. It's called Fomis rhimosus or Philinus rubiniae, and it's a crack cap fungus. Yeah, it's on black locust, and th th you see, you'll see these around. Uh, I was cutting wood uh, last month, and uh, there was a locust I was cutting. This is growing on the side of it, so I cut very close to it to show the white rot. Here it is. You can see where the the peroxides coming from this are bleaching the wood and actually rotting the uh, the interior of this locust tree. Now, locust is very difficult, very hard wood, and it very impervious to rot. It's used a lot for fence posts. Uh, the fact that it does not rot should tell you never eat any mushroom growing on locust because it has very strong uh, resins and toxins in there. But the, nevertheless, this is a, a Fomis rhimosus. It's one you'll see around quite a bit. Here's another of the medicinal mushrooms, uh, so-called medicinal mushrooms, the red belted polypore. You see it has this red band around the outside of it. Uh, it's a potent brown rot fungus. Uh, it gets at the heart, uh, the heartwood of the tree, of pine trees, uh, and uh, it leads to their, their premature death. It enters These things enter the wood by a scar, maybe by a, a, an ax or a, a, a branch breaks off or something, and the fungus gets in and then takes over. Um, it is said to have antioxidant and anti-cancer properties. Uh, that's what they say. Uh, the similar Heterobasidium anosum uh, has a, it looks very similar, somewhat similar, but it has a white band around it and leads to a very destructive uh, disease of oaks, oak trees um, and, and other trees. It's called anosum rot. The interesting thing is DNA evidence shows us that anosum does not live in the United States. It only It's only a European mushroom. But nevertheless, there are uh, four or five different of these species have their own names. We still call them generally Heterobasidion anosum, uh, or DNA will break them off and give them different names. And they have a white pocket rot. If you look here, there's little pockets in there. And that really damages the wood for timber, and it, it just leads to the, uh, the, uh, the decay of the tree and damages the, the entire crop. This one is a, a different kind of mushroom. Isn't this nice? It's a nice, smooth cap. It's not warted. It's, you can reach over and grab it and squeeze it. It feels not unlike flesh, uh, very fleshy. This is Polyporus resinosus or Ixnoderma resinosum. Notice how you say that, Ixnoderma, Ixna, Ixnoderma resinosum. Uh, it, uh, it will grow on, this one when it's on hardwood, on softwood, it's probably called benzoinum, benzoinum, uh, if it's on conifer, but many people say they're the same species. It causes a white rot. It's very fragrant uh, and uh, tender, and when it's young, it's edible. Down here, you can see where the little tiny pores are there growing, but this is edible. I, I have never eaten that, and I think I've missed an opportunity to try it. I think I'll try it again. This is growing uh, underneath trees. It's called the resupinate form here. And then it shelves out here to make these little shelves. Uh, and this uh, this was taken last week, maybe the week before, maybe yeah, last, last week or two. There are a lot of smaller shelves we can look at now and talk about those. Uh, some of them have gills, pores, parchment. Let's have a look at these. These are smaller. This one uh, is very easy to identify and one that you all should be able to identify and put under your belt is something you know. This is the uh, oak maize polypore, uh, Dedalia quercina. Quercina is oak. Dedalia refers to Daedalus, who is, legend has it, lived in chambers and he built wings. Uh, he took feathers and put them on with wax, but a little cocky, he flew too close to the sun when he was escaping his chamber and the wax melted and he plunged to his death, I guess. Uh, but this is the maize polypore on oak. It's really a lovely, lovely mushroom. I mean, just to have in your house on your shelf, just to look at and uh, it's just lovely. Um, 
There is one which is somewhat similar. Uh, the, the oak uh, maize mushroom is rather maybe a half inch thick. This is maybe a quarter inch thick. The, the oak mushroom, the Daedalus uh, grisina, caused brown rot. This causes a white rot of a sapwood. And this is Daedalopsis confragosa. There's a confragrosum of confluence of these different uh, gills and pores, and they merge together there. So it's a maize polypore, but it has a combination of gills and pores. And some of them will be more poroid, some of them will be more gill like. Uh, there's another one which is almost entirely gills, and that is uh, Daedalopsis. Um, mm, forgotten its name now. It grows on, um, I think, maybe pop. I've forgotten the tree it grows on too. That's why it's important to have a field guide with you. you can go, when you find them, you, you look at through the field guide to find out what they are. Uh, probably a good time now. I'll just say uh, anything that says opsis on it, daedalopsis. Opsis means in the face of, it looks like deadless. So this looks like deadless. And uh, so here, here maybe it's a good time here just to, to mention being able to recognize something and being able to identify it. What, as I've been going through this, I've been talking about things I can recognize. You know, when I find it on a tree, would I be able to recognize it there all the time? Sometimes, yes, sometimes no. Sometimes you have to look at it and sort of figure it out. You just look at the wood and say, well, is it white rot or brown rot? You know, are these... Uh, uh, or what, what's the flesh look like? You cut it through and see see what color the flesh is inside. You you might take a spore deposit and see what the what color the spores are, uh, or or uh, uh, what kind of uh, uh, ornamentation they may have on it. So all of those things are clues that you would then use when you go to a, a serious source, and then you would try to confirm your hypotheses about what you think it is. Any of those things which would disconfirm it tells you, well, that's not what it is. It doesn't tell you what it is. It just tells you, you know, if, you, if you're looking for something that has white spores and you make a spore print and the brown spores, well, you know that that just eliminates that. So these are, these are dichotomous keys that are used. And uh, the serious literature that I refer to in that handout will direct you to that. Now, some of those books are over on reserve in the, uh, at the Smiley uh, Research Center. And you might, if you're interested in following this up, make arrangements to go and do that over there. Here's another beauty. Isn't this a beauty? My God. Glowy, oh, this should be glowy O, glowy O phylum, glowy O phylum sepiarium, uh, uh, or lenzites sepiaria. Uh, brown rot, so it was taken out of lenzites. Uh, but this is, this is absolutely gorgeous. It grows on softwood. And it's just a potent brown rot fungus. Uh, I found some just yesterday. Uh, I saw it maybe a week ago. Uh, there was no snow on the ground because the sun had taken it off. It was on um, some, some pine stumps near, uh, near a clearing near me. But I went back and the, the, sun, the, the snow was there. And boy, they just stood out right against that snow. They're just gorgeous things. Uh, um, Glio, Gloiophyllum sepiarium, beautiful mushroom. This is the bear mushroom. Uh, it's called Lentinellus ursinus. Uh, the name I prefer is an older name, uh, Lentinus ursinus. I just, I just, I just, don't you love that name? Lentinus ursinus. You know, it's just, uh, just, it just has a ring to it. But this is Lentinellus ursinus, the bear mushroom. It has this hairy cap, makes it look like, I guess that's reminiscent of a bear. I don't know. And it has these notched gills. You look at the, the, the fresh fruiting specimen, you'll see the gills are notched. And not many fungi have that characteristic. So that would be, if, uh, if, if the mushroom you're looking at does not have that, then it's not going to be a lentinellus. Okay? Uh, this is one which actually the um, uh, Messiah website has used uh, uh, in order to uh, illustrate this, this aberration. These are actually, the gills make pores. Uh, and this again is still lentinus, lentinellus ursinus. Uh, this is a, in a poroid form. Otherwise, it's exactly the same. Um, so I found this one in November, say, and then this would be, this was in January. So this is Lenzites betulina. 
uh, Betulina growing on birch. And this looks a lot like a turkey tail, doesn't it? Just a lot like a turkey tail. And it again has a combination of pores that look like gills. And you can see some of them here over here. And you can differenti uh, differentiate these from um, the Andalopsis by the color of the uh, flesh inside. And your, your, your text that you carry with you will help you do that. So this resembles a polypore. It, it uh, causes white rot of, of sapwood. Um, and again, you'll find these that persist into the wintertime. This is a, a mushroom of late winter, early spring. It's Favilus alveolaris, maybe a new name by now. It, I find it on uh, hickory. I've never tried to eat this, but they say it is edible. It is eatable. You can eat this when it's young and tender. It's kind of woody, kind of tough. has this kind of uh, arching, um, uh, in, very interesting uh, pore, pore like surface underneath it. Another small mushroom here is Philinus gilvus. This is looks like mustard. So uh, oaks and other hardwoods uh, causing a white uh, white rot uh, has very tiny pores. Uh, if you uh, if you can get up close to your screen and look here, you might be able to see it in real life out in the, the light. They'll often give a kind of a iridescent quality. The pores are so tiny there. Uh, uh, mustard color. Uh, and uh, it's gilvus, Philinus gilvus. And then this one here, Panastypticus, that glows in the dark. And I saw this several times walking in almost every walk I took in the last month. So it, it's, it's on, on uh, oaks and other, other trees. This is an oak right here. And you can see that this is the top of it, and this is the bottom of it. And this was taken, you know, just a few weeks ago. You see how still fresh it is. And this will glow in the dark. Okay. Panis stypticus, uh, and it's like a little oyster mushroom, and the gills are underneath, has this kidney kind of shape, and the sessile uh, stem that grows on a little abrupt end, butt ending there. Your eyes need to adjust to the dark, uh, but what they do, you can see it glowing. How's this for a beauty, huh? Pycnopora cinnabarinus. Uh, or Pycnopora sanguineus. Sanguineus is more blood red. Uh, they typically grow on, uh, I find them typically on cherry. And I don't know whether they get the, the pigmentation from the cherry or not. They grow on other wood, but the ter it's most intense on cherry, which this one is. Uh, and these, in addition to some of the turkey tails and other these, will make wonderful little de artistic decorations. Uh, people will soak them and press them and, and preserve them with lacquer and make pendants and earrings and and, and just wonderful little art forms out of them. Um, you see the poroid structure underneath. The, the turkey tails will come out of the turkey tails. Uh, this is a turkey tail. <laughs> this looks like a turkey tail, so we call it a turkey tail. Uh, the name for turkey tail mushrooms is Trimedes versicolor, and it has a lot of different color forms and allies. Here's one that is sort of uh, beigey gray. Here's ones that are blue. Here's ones that are brown. Uh, it used to be called polystictus, and it has a very characteristic way that the pores emerge right from the trauma. They're not in a separate kind of uh, uh, tissue. And polystictus um, are now it's called Trimedes versicolor. Uh, it's rare that you'll find one this this amount of coloration, but they they get that way. And sometimes these blue ones were just the whole whole look of a whole a group of them looking like that. Again, you can just see what beautiful kinds of uh, jewelry you can make out of these. Uh, and again, this is one of the ones which, uh, which in popular literature uh, is reputed to uh, cure cancer. Uh, I've written about that in, uh, in I think, uh, in the, not the current issue of the, the New York Mycological Association's uh, newsletter, but the previous one, I've written about uh, this mushroom there in some detail. Uh, you know, I, I prepared those articles for 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 the local mushroom uh, group, the Mid Hudson group, and I don't know if they've published them. Or not. I don't think they have. Uh, if uh, if anybody from the Mid Hudson is in the the in, in the audience, 
you might want to ask Christine uh, where those manuscripts are and if they can be published. Otherwise, you can go fetch them from the New York website. And this is the false turkey tail here. Uh, they're called a parchment fungus. And here the spores come directly, the basidium is directly mounted on the tissue. Uh, and so it's very smooth here. There's no pores at all. So this is called parchment. They're very thin. And these will, will press very nicely, very easily. And again, they have the alternating bands of color. And some of them can be much more uh, pigmented than these are here. These were growing on oak. Uh, this is a... Uh, um, this is the Sterium austria, uh, and this is Sterium complicatum. Uh, it shows you the brighter orange color. A lot of little tiny little knots of this one here. But these are really beautiful. False, this is the, 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 the classic false turkey tail. There are other things that look like turkey tails. Here is Poronidulus conchifer. I love that name too, Poronidulus. You know, you have pity on Poronidulus conchifer. Conchifer refers to a shell, and these in the wintertime will just, they, they gleam. They're so white, pure white, and they just look like little shells you just picked up off of uh, the, the beaches of, uh, of, of, of a tropical island. They're just a beautiful, pure white. Uh, typically on elm, this little nest will often uh, fall off in the wintertime. Poronidulus conchifer. It's a really pretty mushroom. <clears throat> And this is probably the most common of the small, thin-shelled mushrooms that you might call uh, turkey tails that I found. I'm going to get another drink of water. Hang on. <clears throat> this is Trichaptum biformis. It used to be called Polyporus per pergaminus, or pergaminus because of the purple color. <clears throat> This is the hymenium, the underneath. This is the top. You can see the purple edge to it there. And this is the white uh, wood here. See how it just rots, this white rot here. <clears throat> this is the most typical white rot fungus, most plentiful I see in my walks in the woods. I, found it, I find it on er, virtually every walk I take. Um, and it's uh, on a number of trees. If it's on uh, pine trees, it's called tri Trichaptum abitinum, abies from pine. This is what it looks like in the winter. Okay. Now, maybe one of the reasons I find it is because it's now we know that this, uh, there are probably a half dozen different species there. Uh, DNA breaks them apart into, into that. And they grow on a number of different woods. But the, the biformis, it's called biformis because the pores break up in, into, <coughs> pardon me, oh boy, in a lot of little teeth. Okay, and that's uh, the, the, the biformis there. And this, oh boy, <laughs> this is Schizophyllum commune, uh, the this, this split gill mushroom. Uh, this is the top of it. It's growing here on sticks. This is the top uh, here. This is the bottom here. You see it has these gills that are split. So it's called the split gill mushroom, Schizophyllum split gills. Uh, this is very useful for uh, genetic studies because this mushroom has 23,000 sexes. Okay. Now, how do we know that? Well, there are two genetic loci which code for sexuality and each have a number of different alleles, forms that the gene can take, and the permutation of the combinations of the numbers, you just multiply them over and over again, you know, eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two times one times the ones on the other, that gives you 23,000 sexes. Ain't it wonderful? <laughs> just, it's a real gender bender, boy. So uh, this mushroom, though, you should know that this one, uh, you don't want to, I would not make a tea of this. This one will fruit in your mouth, your lungs, your nails. Uh, it gets into people's systems and causes severe problems there. Uh, uh, I definitely would not call this a medicinal mushroom. Something about spalted wood. 
This is a turkey tail here, Trimedes versicolor. And as you see, as it enters the wood, this is maple. See how it grows out and it's it, in this particular uh, colony here forms a little hegemony. This is my territory, it says. And where it meets the territory of a different colony, the same species, but a different colony, a barrier is formed there. These fungi are fighting for their own territory. They don't want to share it with any other fungus. And so you get this spalted condition. So these are just edges of, of different territories in the wood. You can uh, if you take this wood and you carve it, or you can you end up with these beautiful carvings. These are turned on a, on a lathe. And you can get hardwood and, and treat it by taking this, chopping it up or chopping up some of these mushrooms, putting it in a lot of um, a barrel with a lot of sawdust and put in your chunk of wood, maybe maple or, or whatever. And then you throw some beer on that to get it started. And then it turns into spalted wood and then you can carve in that and turn bowls. I want to call your attention to something else here, though. Notice what you're looking at here is in direct contradiction to the hypothesis proposed in the world or well, the wood wide web of fungi. Uh, for, uh, people who, who propose that hypothesis is that fungi will form a giant fungus that goes through the woods of the forest and will communicate between trees. And one tree over here gets sick and it sends its messages through the through the woods and way over here, maybe a mile or two away, there's another tree and it says, I'm getting, I'm sick, you better get ready because the illness is coming to you. Uh, uh, things of that sort. I have to say that that's a very controversial hypothesis. Um, this Friday, I think, Coma, can, the, the, the Coma uh, Mycological Association is having a talk by, I think it's Tom Horton uh, at, uh, maybe is it Syracuse Department of Forestry, the SUNY Forestry Department, in which he takes issue with that hypothesis uh, in a very strenuous way. Uh, but uh, those of you who, who like to read, you might know that book uh, uh, by, uh, oh gosh, the guys, Merle, Merlin, Merlin, I uh, forgot his name now, <laughs> the book about uh, lichen and uh, uh, and, and he, but he takes this this hypothesis to task in that too. I, I'm great, right? I just forget all this stuff and bring them up and forget it. Yeah, shoot me, I guess. Uh, so a lot, now we come to crusts and small stuff, things that just are left over from the fruiting of the uh, of last summer. Run through these quickly. There are a couple of stalked polypores. These are on downwood. This is the winter polypore, Polyporus brumalis. It exists year round. You will find that in the winter time. Uh, also found in the winter and year round is Polyporus varius or Polyporus elegans. Now it's called Seriopurus leptocephalus, means a skinny head. Uh, so there's a skinny headed black stemmed mushroom there. Uh, so that's, uh, those are two poor uh, polypores you'll find. Here's the Polyporus varius uh, uh, covering a log. There's probably a uh, four or five bushel of this mushroom on this log. I don't know of any particular use of the mushroom, but lots of them are around there. These are two crust fungi. This is Urpex lacteus, white, uh, Urpex olivaceum, uh, olive colored, uh, now called Hidnicati olivaceum. So the white tooth crust and the brown tooth crust. And you can tell these, uh, among other things, by the color of the crust. And then you start to look at some of the other uh, microscopic characteristics that, that are there. And your text will, will help you differentiate among those. If we find on our walk any place where wood chip has been used, if you use wood chips around your house, in your garden, check them over and you might find growing on the wood chips the remains of these uh, uh, bird's nest fungi. They're called a bird's nest because you can see they look like a little nest and little eggs in there. When a drop of rain comes down, it hits inside that and it squirts the the uh, the uh, the little uh, this little egg out uh, with considerable force. The egg is attached by a little spider web uh, sticky fundament, I think it's called, and it grows out and it it then will wrap around a twig or something. It will hang there. The egg will hang there, and the spores will then mature and come out of this little egg, and they'll they'll inoculate new wood chips. So this is a uh, striatus. This is Crucibulum levi. 
uh, two of many kinds of uh, Burgess fungus. There's a text also over in the uh, at the um, Smiley Center, Burgess fungus by um, Brody, I think is the author. This is a wonderful little fungus. It's hard to find, but it's kind of uh, worth looking for. Just to put it on your life list. It's Cryptoporus, Cryptoporus vulvatus. Uh, it grows on two-needle pine. Uh, I think maybe Scott's pine is one of those. And I think maybe up on the uh, on the gunks, there's some uh, Scott's pine there. Uh, and Lauren will probably know and can correct us on that. But you see, the, it's polypore. It's covered over with this veil. And if I cut it off here, you can see pores inside of it. And uh, this is where little bugs have gone inside, little beetles have gone inside and eaten that. And they persist year-round. Uh, on the ground, you might find this on rotted wood. This is Daldinia concentrica. That's what we call it, although that's a European species. The American species is Daldinia childiae, IA, uh, and that's the American species. Uh, these are carbon balls. And when they sporulate, they just throw black spores all over the place, as you can see on this log right here. And they, they do this in a time fashion. So you put them on a piece of paper and boom, there it is. It brings these spores right out. Now, if you have a piece of paper moving underneath it, what you find is that it'll drop the spores and then it drops the spores and it drops the spores. And you can measure, you know, the time at which it drops the spores. And this actually uh, was, I, I think, a high school student, maybe a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout, suggested this experiment to bring up to outer space on a spaceship. And it works up in outer space, too. Pretty cool. If you find a place where squirrels have been digging in the ground, uh, uh, they may be after this, this fungus here, which they locate by smells, pheromones in the fungus here will release odors. We call these truffles. So they release odors and squirrels will dig for it. This is a, a truffle. It's Alaphomyces granulatus. It's found in hemlock. And uh, you, uh, you, if you dig down, you find a place where squirrels are digging there, dig down to the place where the, the mineralized soil and the duff come together and you might find these little underground truffles. Here's a puffball, a tumbling puffball about the size of a golf ball. The wind blows it around. As it tumbles around, the spores pop out of that. You might see some of these in the woods here. You might see some of these. This is a pear-shaped puffball growing on uh, rotten wood. They'll, they'll live on wood for a long, long time. See the pear shape right there? They're edible until they start to turn olive brown. When the spores turn that color, then they're too old to eat. But this one has a good flavor. Most puffballs don't. This is scleroderma. It has a brown spore mass. A, I'm sorry, a black spore mass, purple black spore mass. You probably won't see this around, but you will see these kind and with the little ostules in the top or these kind here. These are uh, uh, scleroderma. They have a thick skin, so they, they're rather resistant to decay. Uh, this is the poison. This is actually uh, uh, scleroderma sepa, but it's very similar to the poison pig skin, scler scleroderma uh, citrinum which is very similar to that. So you might find those around too. Uh, in the bigger uh, puffballs, these, this is vasiformis here, vase-shaped puffball. They will have the, the gleba, the spore mass here. As long as it's white, they're edible. Uh, when at, at the bottom there, there's a, 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 a non-sterile a base. And when that, uh, that will persist and it'll look like these. And depending upon the, uh, the type of mushroom that's on the top, if it's uh, Calvatia cyathiformis, they'll have purple spores. If it's uh, 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 Calvatia craniformis, they'll have brown spores. And craniformis looks pretty much the same. It's more, more like a skull shape, more wrinkled to it. They're both edible until they start to color. Almost sure to see this on our walk is the rhizomorphs of Armillaria melia. This is, uh, this is the fungus which feeds these fruit, this fruiting bodies right here. So these will take play, take part in, in the tree. That's it's a, a white rot. They will rot the uh, the, um, the the base of the tree, and the tree will tumble over, and then other mushroom, other fungi will take take advantage of it. So it starts as a parasite. Then it uh, once the tree is dead, it's a saprophyte, and these these strands will run for 
hundreds of yards in the forest looking for another tree to infect the shoestring rot of uh, Armillaria melia. And then finally, we can end up with lichens. <clears throat> lichens are, can be identified by form. These are filamentous. These are fruticose. They look like they're fruiting structures. These look like leaves. They're folios, the green folios. These look like crusts, so they're crustose. So that would be the common field way to identify them. More technical identification would take the name, the technical name of the mushroom, the binomial, from the name of the fungus. Uh, and this fungus here, uh, the gold shield crust fungus, grows only within uh, 100 yards or so of salt water. So I find this a lot in my house in Maine, but I don't find it down here. Um, so that brings us to the end of this, uh, this presentation here. Uh, and we want to leave room to talk about it. So until we meet again, I say happy trails. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Um, so a couple of things. I think the words you were looking for earlier is placebo. The placebo. Placebo. Effect. That's right. The placebo. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Raha, uh, uh, put that one in the chat. And then the book by Merlin that you were referencing is Entangled Life Thank you very by much. Merlin Sheldrake. Thank you very and much. yes, Emily knew that one. So, uh, so shout out to Emily for that. Um, it is time to open it up for questions. So if you have a question, um, you are more than welcome to type it in the chat or you can can raise your hand for the speak and it looks like we have someone who has a question very good all right so Hassan has a question let's see oh maybe Hassan isn't here anymore I don't know okay well I'll check the chat again and see if we have any questions at all this was a really wonderful presentation and uh, now that I've sat through um, several of yours I'm beginning to recognize the uh, the mushrooms um, and it's fun to oh. see them in different seasons <laughs> as well <laughs> so any questions yeah yeah and you know I know I know it's uh we, we still have a fair number of people here and, and maybe you just answered all their questions it was such a good presentation so <laughs> well yeah yeah it, it's a it should be really nice out this weekend so even if you aren't coming along on the walk this weekend um that you know it sh you should get out and you know explore your yards local parks look for some of these um see if you can spot any of them um it's certainly as you were talking um and i've been thinking about this a lot recently about how um it's so important to know uh your trees as well um so yes. that you know what mushrooms to look for because some of them are very specific to oaks or birches or hemlocks as you were saying so so knowing some tree id um you know maybe carrying a tree id book along with you as well is going to help out so so yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I just I will mention a few places where if you're not coming on the walk with us, you might want to go. Um, the Taconic Hereford Estate in Dutchess County uh, off uh, between Millbrook and uh, and Verbank is uh, uh, a really good spot. It's about a thousand acres there. There are lots and lots of trails and mixed forests. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, cats and the Fats, uh, Fats and the Cats a Bicycle Group has made lots of trails in there. Uh, small trails uh, where bicycles go. And there are a lot of bikers in there now, and, and not machine bikes, but pedal bikes. A lot of cross-country skiing there. There are big roads or small trails and lots of lots of mushrooms. There are lots of downwood there, and uh, you'll find a lot of, I think, you, I think you'll find a lot of things there. If you go there, you want to check out the back to the pond gut area, which is a really special uh, area. There Are there bear tracks back in there? Yeah, I'll, I'll send bear tracks two or three days ago. Oh. Yeah. The other place uh, I would say to look, it would be down in uh, along the Hudson River in the uh, the Mills Estate area. Those old estates alongside on the, the uh, eastern banks of the Hudson River. Um, you're, it's a milder climate there, and uh, you'll find uh, lots of down trees, a lot of old trees. I mean, really, you know, 400-year-old oaks and big pines and spruce. Uh, so it, it, it's really a, a wonderful area uh, to, to mushroom in. Um, so I'd recommend both of those places. Wonderful. Um, what was the name of the mushroom that glows in the dark again? Yes, uh, this one is, well, there are actually two. Panis stipticus is one. 
that's the one that looks like little um, little oyster mushrooms. It's uh, 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 they're small, they may be a, a half inch in diameter, uh, uh, and they grow on oak. And then the other is the rhizomorphs of the honey mushroom. They also glow in the dark. And I think they use both use the same mechanism. It may be the one that lightning bugs use. It's an energy release from uh, ADP, ATP, or maybe I have that backwards. It's a, it's a, I think it's a, must be a phosphate. Is that a phosphate energy reaction? Mm -hmm. And and it gives off that 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 uh, faint uh, yellowish uh, glow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, can you repeat the names of the places that you suggested where to go again? Yes, uh, alongside the uh, Hudson River uh, in Statsburg, uh, south of Rhinebeck, there's a place called the uh, Nori Point, N-O-R-R-I-E, P-O-I-N-T, Nori Point. And uh, there's a number of trails through that area, and it goes up to, some, it, it links some of the mansions together in the area. Uh, free access there. And there. There are wonderful trails that exist there. There's a, there's a museum there. The Hudson River Estuarine Green Society has a has a headquarters there. Uh, if you go up a little further, there's a, there's another one uh, up in uh, north of Red Hook. Uh, I've forgotten the name of that, but the number of those 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 estates. Down, Fonstock is down uh, south in. Uh, south of, of, of Dutchess County, but those are there. The other one would be off route, uh, the Taconic Park, and that would be between Millbrook, between Route 44 and Route 55 is uh, the Taconic uh, Hereford Estate. And um, it's a uh, about a thousand acres of, uh, of mixed uh, woods, lots of uh, abandoned uh, stone uh, 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 walls through the area. There's some old house sites in the area. There's uh, lots and lots of interesting trees there. There's some big walnuts that uh, are there, big oaks. Uh, um, so it's a good area. There's also, um, I've forgotten, there's this, this a state park on the same section of, of uh, the Taconic there too. I've forgotten the name of that. Uh, but but those, those are two places I would suggest, the Taconic Hereford Estate and Norrie Point. All right. Awesome. Yeah. And I know that there's a question about the uh, the handout that you're mentioning. So yeah. um, in um, we have our little chat. There's also um, files. You, hopefully you'll see like there's a little section for files. It's a little paper clip. Um, there's a shared handout there. Um, I am going to this is a re we're being recorded. Um, so I am going to send a link to this recording to you uh, probably tomorrow. <laughs> so look for that tomorrow when I send the link out to everyone who's registered so you can um, revisit this. I'll also include the handout with that. So um, so if you're kind of having trouble with um, downloading the handout right now here, um, you'll get it with the link to this presentation. So, um, and again, this this presentation will be available on our YouTube channel. And I know, Bill, you referenced the chanterelles um, and the ecological importance of fungi, those two webinars that have happened. If you missed those um, from the past year and a half or so, we have um, we have all of them archived um, mm. on our website mm. and on our YouTube channel. So you are able to access those there. So um, so look for those um, in our archives for our webinars. We have lots of other webinars that have been happening too. So it's kind of fun to, to uh, pick a topic that you might be interested in learning more about. Um, and, and like I said, there's a lot of these in the mushroom, our mushroom archive of these that Bill has done for us. Mm. So, and you mentioned some of them. Well, yes, I, I do miss meeting people face to face. This is, I mean, this is a very efficient way to get information out and to store it and have it available. That's wonderful. But I, I really do miss uh, walking in around people when I'm giving a talk and, and we can talk rather than me just shouting. Oops. <laughs> I, I think we all miss that a little bit, don't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's good to get out. Um, yeah, and we uh, we were mentioning at the start of our program um, because I know that that our fungus walks with you um, fill up really quickly. We only have so many spots, um, so we are going to be in talks of, um, to do a spring um, webinar and and walk to go with it. So keep your eyes open for that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Good. Yeah. 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 It kind of uh, a little bit. 
Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. I, I, I really look forward to seeing some of you on uh, on Saturday. On yeah, time. I think that there's a few, quite a few people who joined us this evening who will also be joining us on Saturday. And it was mm-hmm. wonderful that you mentioned um, some places to go. I know that the weather is going to be... Um, lovely the next couple of days so you'll probably be itching to get outside yeah. and it, with the snow melt you'll be able to see more and more of the mushrooms that's true so. yeah I, I should just mention one other thing I, mm-hmm. I've, I've i've recently looked at the positivity the the omicron positivity rate for ulster county it's down at three percent it is very low so uh we are one of the safer places to be nowadays uh, out person to person uh mm-hmm. and uh we'll be outdoors and uh yeah. Yeah, we'll be bundled up too. <laughs> we'll be bundled up. I know Saturday, of course, is going to be like the cooler of the next handful of days, but yeah. that's okay. <laughs> so you you will get you will get to us. You will get out the uh, the address of where we're going to be meeting on Friday. Yes, yes, Good. I will. Yep, on Saturday. Yes, and um, finding out about our um, programming, our spring programming. Of course, you can check our website. The March programs are already up and posted and you can register for those. Um, We also have something called the Get Into Nature, which is a newsletter. Um, And uh, our members do get that in their email. Um, We send it out as an e-blast. So you are welcome to become a member of Mohonk Preserve and receive those. So you kind of have first dibs instead of just guessing when things are open. (laughs) Um, But uh, frequent our website um, and uh, check out what is coming along. As I said, March programs already open for registration and um, the April and May ones will be coming soon as well. It's a constant cycle of me putting together these programs and Mm. making sure that they get out to everyone in just due time. So, yeah. Mm. And a yeoman's job. You do very good at that. It's good to see all this happening. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. It keeps me busy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Any of the last 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 time to get your question in? Anybody? I guess not. Yeah, I think that we got everything. <laughs> well, this this has really been a fantastic talk. Thank you, Bill, for your time, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, and look for more programming uh coming up in the spring, some more mushroom things. Okay. Yeah, thanks everyone. Sure. Bye-bye. <laughs>